Well, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's Andrew Jenkins here from Leaders Live. I've got Katie Maycock in the room uh, today, <laughs> and I'm going to introduce her fully in a moment, but Katie is a well-being fitness and nutrition expert, and she's got loads of brilliant tips for us today, and I'm really excited to have Katie in the room today. Katie's a great friend of mine too, um, delighted that she's uh, said yes to doing this interview, so you know, I'm, I'm as happy as anything. Um, and just a quick one before we get to Katie. Um, so since the pandemic, you know, we've really become really quite acutely aware of, um, I'm just waiting for the, the live thing to come up on my stream. I can't see it yet. We're really acutely aware of, of the effects of stress and anxiety on our work and our home lives and, and our mental well-being um, is really a top business agenda item right now for, for, for all of us, really, uh, for all businesses. And as we come out of lockdown, it's really pertinent that we're kind of asking these sorts of questions today um, with Katie in the room. And because we might be left sort of behaving, we might be left thinking that is mental health ruining our day? And if we're business owners, we might ask the question, is pressure dead in the water? Right. So those are a couple of questions that we look for and a lot more today uh, from from working with Katie. So if you don't know me, hello, I'm Andrew Jenkins. I'm delighted to be with you this morning. In the last 18 years, I've run a business called PDX Consulting. I work with leaders. I build teams and I inspire organisations through keynote speech, speeches and um, and things like that and, and public speaking engagements, those kind of things. Um, I also am known for the kind of high performance team guy, I suppose, if you want a label. Um, so Leaders Live, which is what we're on now, this is, uh, this is my new channel. Um, delighted to, uh, to have launched this in the last few weeks. Uh, so it's brand, brand new. Um, and its idea is really, it's a new channel, it's edutainment. It's, it's to help businesses, business owners, people that manage teams in all sorts of ways to help you to manage your people because our belief is that really the next the next new normal will be, business success will be through our people, right? And that success is a team game. That's kind of where we're coming from today. Um, oh, and I can see myself live, so I'm just going to press that so I can see the comments as they're coming along. Um, so yeah, uh, welcome to everybody. I'll just turn the volume down on that so I've got no volume. So Katie Maycock is in the room today. Let me bring her back into the room. Where are we? Here she is. Katie, good morning to you. Welcome. Let me uh, let me give you an introduction. So how are you doing today, Katie? I'm doing fantastic on a Tuesday. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> You're very welcome. On a Tuesday. Yeah, it's only a Tuesday, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I honestly had no way. I woke up this morning and I was like, what day is it? <laughs> it's only Tuesday. Yes, it is. It's... <laughs> That's kind of the pandemic thing, isn't it? You know, because every day seemed to be the same, particularly in the early lockdown stage. You're like, what day is it today? And every day seemed to be a stress day as well. I don't know whether, whether that was the same <laughs> for you, but it's just the pandemic seemed to crank us up to a whole new level of uh, stress. If you just heard those peeps, that's that's the dishwasher going, by the way. I'm, uh, I'm in a different location today than I normally am. So let me just um, let me just introduce Katie. So Katie's a well-being and fitness and nutrition guru. She's an expert in that field. She works with business leaders and teams. Um, she's the founder of Get Your Get Your Shit Together, folks. So really interesting uh, what Katie's got to offer today. Um, she deals with tough subjects, right? And um, really tough subjects around uh, the impact of business success and stress in the workplace and anxiety. These are big topics in today's post-pandemic world, folks. So um, so we've got the right person in the room for the right time. So anxiety, stress, nutrition, mental well-being, mental wellness, these are her things. Eating disorders, um, eating addictions, those kind of things, they're all in Katie's remit. And she's, she can go far, she can go broad, and she can go really deep in this subject today. And um, in her past, in her past, she has competed in fitness and um strength competitions you know those those kind of um you know those kind of posy things and and my gosh katie looks great she's got what that's called a dorito back right she's um, <laughs> so you don't mess with katie you know she's um she's muscle lady she's fitness lady she knows her stuff um i think her previous background was in sales and recruitment so she comes with with all of that sales expertise and the kind of stresses and strains of the recruitment industry are something that are she's very passionate about. She's founder of, of um, an ambassador to to those kind of causes. 
so she 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 develops leadership programs to deal with stress, to mental wellness, and to optimize business performance. That's kind of a quick resume uh, for Katie. <laughs> and I've been following Katie's fitness guidelines for a long time now. For over a year, I've known Katie for for a good year now. And I have to say her goals um, around fitness and well-being and uh, intermittent fasting stuff is second to none. I followed all of her advice on that. And I have to say, I feel a million dollars. So, you know, all that lockdown, you know, and all the OCD and ADHD that that's got to cause me and flip back to when I was at school again, going down to the downstairs part of my brain. Honestly, Katie, you've really helped me out during that lockdown period. So um, I want to say a big thank you to you um, for helping me during a really rough time um, during that, that lockdown period. You're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> So, Luke, listen, we've, we've got a few questions um, this morning. Um, we've got quite a few viewers online, I can see. So, um, so welcome, Katie. You know, as a health and wellness expert, Katie, mm -hmm. you know, how does stress impact the quality of our thinking, um, you know, in the workplace? Over to you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So I think the biggest thing when we're looking at stress, you know, a lot of what I talk about is the impact that stress and anxiety has on the body and the mind because right. you can't have one without the other, really. You have to look at working with them with them both. them both but i think one of the biggest misconceptions is that stress is actually good for good for work and that actually is true to a point but we're talking prolonged stress so i'm gonna just you know with the, if any whoever's watching think about when we first went into lockdown you probably actually went oh my gosh i need to work if you're a business owner you're probably going oh my gosh i need to work and so your focus mm. probably went skyrocketed you're able to focus you're able to concentrate you're probably working longer hours and that all seemed really good because you needed that, right? You're like, oh my right. gosh, I, we, we didn't know where we were. We're in yeah. uncertain times, so we had yeah. to focus. Now, the problem with that is is people can tap into that and kind of get addicted to that because it's like, you know what? I'm getting the results that I want. Um, maybe you're making more sales. Maybe your business is growing and developing and you're thriving in a pandemic or you know, maybe you're just surviving. That's completely fine. <laughs> However, mm. in the long term, that's when the issues come into play. It really does change the way that we can focus, concentrate, um, the way that we actually take in information completely changes, the way that we problem solve. So a lot of people, when we're looking at, um, if we're in prolonged stress, decision-making. As a business leader and as a business owner or whatever you're doing, you have to make decisions. And typically people will either make rash decisions, like I don't have time to deal with that, that's a quick decision, <laughs> and not really think about the outcome. Yeah. Um, or they might actually get to the point where it's like, I don't know what the right decision is and kind of right. get that very, yeah. like that nervous, like I don't want to make a decision. So mm. if I don't make a decision, yeah. something bad will happen kind of thing. So it really does change the way that we process information, the way that we think. So you know, it has, yeah. So right there, Katie, you know, about processing information. You know, I found very much that during the lockdown, lockdown one was okay-ish, you know, yeah. it was all new, wasn't it? Lockdown two was like, mm, really? Lockdown 33, um, lockdown three, but I call it lockdown 33. Yeah, that had quite a deep effect on lots of people. And mm -hmm. But I really get what you're saying about that work, 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 because that's how it was, wasn't it, in the first part of that lockdown. It just felt like we had this spike of, right, we've got to work, work, work. And that's mm -hmm. okay, as you're saying, for a short period of time. It's when it's prolonged yeah. is when the problems start. And I noticed, because I, you know, I think I'm quite a self-aware guy, but this stuff really sneaked up on me that I found that I was starting to lose the upstairs part of my brain, you know, that clear decision-making thinking stuff. Yep. And little by little, I was wandering down a staircase that I didn't realise I was going down. It's like a bridge that you cross. It's a long bridge. So you don't notice the difference. And you know the difference between my upstairs and downstairs brain was, it took me a while to figure out what was going on, Katie. Well, it also impacts your emotions. Mm. It impacts the way that you react right. to things as well. Sorry. So, you know, if you think about where your our decision-making skills sit, they do sit in that emotional part of the brain as well. Mm. So if we don't get to the part where we can go, what you're calling the upstairs brain, which is five times slower than the downstairs brain, <laughs> as we'll use your language. Really? Um, wow. Well, it's because it's reactionary, right? If you think yeah. about it, you know, if we're looking at it from a processing information and we break it down into three parts, we've got your survival part, you've got your emotional part, and then you've got your rational thinking part of the brain. Mm -hmm. If you kind of get stuck in the emotional and the and the survival part of the brain, which people can get stuck into, you become reactionary, you become frustrated, you can become angry, you can right. become, yeah. you can also become very passive as yeah. well. So if you think about it, you become yeah. passive like 
you know, for anyone that maybe has a team underneath them, you might notice somebody in your team going, yeah, 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 I'll do that, I'll do that, I'll do that, and never executing anything, or they just mm. ignore and don't and don't do anything. And that is just a massive, massive sign of how we're processing information. Right? Is that the fight, flight, freeze, flock thing going on there? That some people just freeze yeah. and don't do anything? Because I found that I was like being very impulsive and yeah. wanted to make decisions really quickly and jump to stuff. By the way, good morning, Graham, and good morning, Andrea. So nice to see you both. Um, <laughs> great that you're here. So sorry, I'm just jumping into no, the chat No, that's okay. There. Yeah. So uh, it sounds like, you know, good times, bad times. You know, it's a bit of a sine wave, really. And, and uh, you know, we need to ride. Is it is, is that what I'm also picking up from you, Katie? You need to ride a curve here? It is. I mean, I think to be fair, mm. I think when we're looking at, stressful situations you know the last 12 well it's not 12 months anymore it's what 14 16 months, 14 now. 16 months. Yeah. <laughs> we're getting on now yeah. um i think if you if we really look at how that works i think the thing is though it's you've got to go with the wave it, it, mm. it's a, there's a natural wave you're going to have yeah. spikes and yeah. that's completely yeah. fine that's that yeah. you know that really big burst of you know that stress response where you're like really focused you're really concentrating okay. um you know the first sign of burnout is actually excitement and that's actually not a bad uh, thing because you're working hard you're doing okay. your thing that's not a that's not a problem it's what you do after that because i mm. think you, you can get really addicted to that first Ooh. boost of adrenaline right yeah. that boost yeah. of focus that boost of energy but it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to have moments where you have to work really hard, but you have to be able to come back down, switch off, you know, tune out, you know, allow your brain to process the information that you've just taken in mm -hmm. and what, what you've been doing to help you better make decisions. You can't keep ramming information in there, working 12, 16 hour days, whatever it is, yeah. and think your brain's going to be functioning at the same high level as it was, you know, week after week, you know, and everyone's really different. Like for instance, you might be able to do it for three months and be completely fine. You know, I know younger guys that are like, oh, I've, I've been doing this for like six months. And I was like, let's have a chat in another six months. Let's see how you're going physically then. Like, yeah. let's, let's have a chat about that then. So it's, it's being able to, yeah, it's riding the wave, but it's also being, you said the word before, self-aware. It's actually going, you know what? I've pulled some pretty long hours. Yeah. I have the energy to do it, but it's not sustainable if not I keep tapping into that. Yeah. And the thing is, we might not recognize that. So, you know, what are the subtle triggers here? That's the interesting thing is because you talked about this switch off moment, tune out moment. These are mm -hmm. really important. And yet when we're in that stressful situation, we just we kind of shut off to that, don't we? Completely yeah. ignore it. So, you know, what are the triggers that we need to look out for here? What are the kind of behavior shifts, Katie, that we need to be aware of? You talk, when we were talking about self-awareness. What are the little yeah. subtle shifts here? So I look at, when I'm looking at um, stress responses, I'm looking at the physical, mental and emotional stuff so we can break that down. So some people might actually be able to see, you know what, I might actually not be coping with stress very well or I might be in that stress response for a little too long. Yeah. By looking at how they're physically reacting. Mm. So looking at how you're sleeping. Like okay. are you getting to sleep okay? Are you waking up okay? Are you having sleep. a full night's sleep? If you're not, that's an, like, how let's have a conversation with that. Uh, um, another physical sign can be, you know, your physical health. Are you feeling run down? Are you generally just not feeling great? Are you starting to feel tired throughout the day that you typically weren't feeling? How's your gut health? You know, like my business is called Get Your Shit Together, literally and figuratively, because I talk <laughs> about gut health. Gut health. Um, yeah. you, know, you know, if you're starting to suffer from what people call IBS, which is, IBS. you know, you know mm. ir so irritable bowel syndrome, so things mm. like bloating. Mm -hmm. gas, upset stomachs, not being able to go to the bathroom. There's some pretty big physical signs as well. And there's just other things that you can look at physically as well. Maybe you've got aches and pains. Maybe you're just feeling really tired. You know, I burnt out twice when I was in my early, my mid-20s. And i got to say, me thinking that I was 26 and I had aches and pains, thinking that was normal, is 100% not normal. So yeah. being able to, to understand just physically how you're going. Then we've got to look at the emotional side. You're right. If you are somebody that's usually cool, calm and collected and you're starting to get more frustrated, more aggressive, getting angrier, you know, you're quick to anger. Mm. These are some of the behavioral signs that you can check for yourself and even within your team. Like if let's go back to the, the physical sign in your teams. If your team, if somebody in your team is starting to take more days off or they're just, you know, maybe you've been in Zoom meetings and they start switching off their camera and they're just not really feeling good and you can pick up on that, that's a really big sign as well. Yeah. And then you've also got to look at the mindset piece and the mental, you know, the mental health aspect, which is how am I, you know, how am I concentrating? Um, am I able to concentrate? Am I able to work at the same efficiency as I was before? 
Yeah. So being able to look all, at all those different signs to be able to go, actually, you know what, I, I probably need to start slowing down. That's really interesting. Graham says here, Graham Coth, um, helping you rock the world is his strap. I love that. <laughs> uh, Graham, for me, um, as as a creative, so Graham's a creative, a fundamental to sleep well, eat well, keep healthy, take time for myself. I mean, he's so spot on there. And that's as a creative, you know, so he's really recognising those signs and but if so, we just break into creative and business owners though yeah. business owners have to be creative yeah I, well, because I, they have to make decisions and absolutely. and you know it's a different kind of creative it's you know i'm a business owner i'm not i'm not artsy at all like i have that's not that's not my gene at all but when i'm building my business i have to think of business strategies i have to think of yeah. you know workshops and, and leadership training and webinars mm. that are engaging and that's that's my creative right like it's different but it's my you have to have the space to be able to to do that yeah i i completely agree with that and and just you know just to kind of come back onto those so in terms of some simple signs sleep right kt oh sorry one. wrong one so here we go. Where, where are you? I've lost you for a minute. Where are you? There you are. And then where's the other scene? Just bear with me. There we go. That's the scene I wanted. Yeah, technology. Technology. Hey. So um, sleep, I was almost going to say scenes then. So sleep is a key one, you know, an indicator mm -hmm. for you. Another indicator is you know, waking up at night, having a pen and pad by the, by the bedside, perhaps, is another indicator. Mm -hmm. Feeling run down. Um, you know, how's your gut health? bloating mm -hmm. ibs those kind of those are standard kind of things but really easy to ignore right it's just a phase i'm going through yeah and then sort of um other interesting it talks about emotion uh i'll go on to emo, uh, emotional side of the moment but the aches and pains so that's an interesting one someone told me some time ago that they they felt a pain in their back and apparently back pain for some reason is can be quite attributable to stress as well i thought it was all in the stomach area but is there anything no it's no? yeah so mm. If you think about how we physically sit mm. and how our body physically right. is when we're under stress, <laughs> you know, when we're calm, we've got our shoulders down, yeah, we're relaxed, yeah. we're a bit more fluid. Yeah. But when we're stressed out and we're sitting, if we're sitting at the desk for a long period of yeah, time, we're hunched over, our shoulders up, yeah. um, we can hold a lot of tension in our back. Yeah. And so uh, it can be, it can be, um, you know, that can be a huge issue as well. Okay, I get it. So that's the back bit. So Andrea says, so big on gut health just now um big big on uh, be kind to yourself and putting self-care at the top of the list the space with a closed clinic um allowed space for to reassess absolutely i like that so she's finding space to mentally unwind um but you, and that's other things that you mentioned about the mental side so watching your concentration your calmness how reflective mm -hmm. am i have i lost that reflectivity am i becoming very instinctive which was my piece which again mm -hmm. strays into the emotions of quick anger you know um, quick to act perhaps avoidance you know taking days off excuses those kind of things are some of the the areas that we need to look out for right katie yeah i think one of the biggest things as well you know um, another one is being really withdrawn. So if you're uh, somebody that's very outgoing and yeah. very, you know, if you've got something in your team that's very outgoing and then all of a sudden they start being a bit more quiet, they start being mm. a bit more withdrawn, mm. that's another pretty big sign. It's not all about the the fire, the, all the fireworks. It's actually people who are just <laughs> starting yeah. to get a bit more quiet than they typically were, um, you know, and performance, right? Performance is a big one. So being yeah. able to, like, if your performance has dropped in your workplace, you know, it's easy to turn around and go, oh, well, it could be the market. It could absolutely be the market, but it could also be the fact that you're not able to problem solve, be creative in being able to, to problem solve there as well. So yeah, I suppose, that's a big yeah. one. That's one thing leads to another, doesn't it? It could be the environment that causes that, but it's the effect on us, which is the key thing, right? Okay, yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, so, you know, how do we kind of shift those behaviours then, Katie? You know, how do we reframe that? You know, what kind of things can we do? So we've become aware of it. What's next? I think one of the biggest things is, again, I break it down to the three parts, which is the physical, the mental and the emotional. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing is when we start seeing habits and we start seeing behaviours that we're not particularly liking, it's being able to take a step back and actually going, okay, cool, what can I actually do for myself to help make sure that I'm not going to burn out, that make sure that I am taking care of myself. And it can be looking at, you know, when looking at the physical side, it's looking at your diet, your exercise and your sleep. Like which one of those is completely off kilter that you need to fix. Now, I always say sleep should be the foundation of what you do because um, sleep is just super, super important. We all kind of, I so one that. thing that we all kind of feel is a bit like, 
I'm really busy. I'll just get a little bit less sleep tonight. And it's like, no, no, don't be doing that. That's super important for your health. Gotcha. So, you know, making sure that you are getting enough sleep, getting enough, getting enough rest. That's really important. Looking at your diet, you know, when we're really stressed and busy, what's, what's, you know, the, what are the three things that we drop when we're really stressed and busy? It's usually our diet, our exercise and our sleep, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Because the time compresses the, I don't have yeah. time to have a healthy meal or I don't have time right. to exercise. I don't okay. have time to sleep. You know, I've got to stay up late. I've got to get up early. It's just what my schedule is right now. So being able to be aware of that and being actually going, being able to say, actually, my sleep is more important than doing that extra hour of work in the morning because it's probably not your most productive work right. um, or in the evening, whatever it is. Mm. Um, you know, making sure that you're getting outside, getting some exercise in there as well. Here's the other thing, yeah, right? Get exercise is super important when we're looking at um, stress management because of the endorphins. Also, it just of helps course. with that. Yeah. Well, let's go talk about the fight or flight response, right? Our body yeah. is primed to either run away or fight a potential threat. And we're sitting mm. there. We're not actively moving. But if Good we point. get up and we move, we can actually walk that out. Uh, this is why sometimes out. when you're having an yeah. uncomfortable conversation at work, it's nice yeah. to do the walk and talk okay. because you're actually a bit more calm. Um, and making sure that you're getting, you know, your diet, you know, you're getting your diet, um, you know, you're on board as well so making sure you're eating healthy as well we all know how to eat healthy we all know what's unhealthy like i've been a nutritionist for 15 years now <laughs> trust me you all know how to eat healthy it's understanding why you're not eating healthy is the biggest okay. piece of the puzzle there so when we start picking up beef burgers and um yeah those kind of things yeah, it, yeah okay. it's a big one and then obviously when we're looking at the emotional side it's being mm. able to understand hang on a second i'm not behaving the way that i want to why is that like right. what are my behaviors demonstrating demonstrating to me but if you get the first parts right like the diet the exercise and the sleep everything does fall you know does fall into fall into place but you've got to make sure you're taking care of your mindset as well okay you've got to take care that your stress mat you're taking care of your stress management mm. so these are things that we need to take responsibility for personally i'm going to yeah. come on to um a boss's view in a moment so if you're you know if, if you're a leader of a team say for example but just before i do that tanya uh, which man is watching so hi Tanya so this is a great discussion and thank you for the insights I find myself holding a large amount of tension in back oh in the back and the thing that releases it is uh, killing a couple of laps in the swimming pool cool so yeah straightening yeah. that back swimming moving definitely a connection between your posture tensions in your body etc well we release a lot more cortisol when we're stressed right when we, yeah. when we push our bodies like like this yeah interesting um, so Okay, so if I was a boss now, you know, and I'm looking at my team, what kind of responsibilities have I got for them? And what time, you know, what do I need to, what do I need to do? And how do I help other people around me? So I can, yeah. get, you know, help them to perform, basically. Yeah, so this is the, this is the million dollar question, right? Yeah, like, this the million, is million dollar, dollar question. This yeah. million dollar question for, for uh, leaders and, and business uh -huh. owners. So I think the first thing that you need to do as a business leader is understand how your behavior is impacting on your team. Right. So if you're incredibly stressed out, look, we as much as we try to hide it, humans have been around for an awfully long time. We have been able to pick up subtle cues. And we still haven't got this. <laughs> I know. We were able to pick up on slight changes in the face, our our, our postures, things like that. We, we do have that for survival reasons. So we will pick up on that. So if you are very stressed out, managing your stress will actually change your behavior and how you react to your team, okay. which is then going to in part put that onto your team as well right okay That's so a, you, manage the amount of emotional energy which you're carrying which you're projecting onto your team mm -hmm. right okay. it might never be subconscious right yeah. it might be subconscious you might not actively be doing it but being able mm. to understand actually let's let's do that i think you know this last year one of the biggest things that leaders have had to do is be really transparent about how they're feeling the things that Absolutely. they're doing yeah. um what's happening in the business that's a really big one as well mm. so that's some of the stuff that you can do but learning to develop the conversation because talking about mental health in the workplace mm. is still even though it's more talked about which is awesome high five to everyone that's creating that yeah. conversation <laughs> But it's still an uncomfortable conversation. Yeah. So being able to develop those communication skills to be able to have a chat with your have a chat with your guys and go, actually, how are you doing? Like, what's yeah. going on with you? Like, you know, we're all working from home now. It might not be work mm. that's stressing them out. Being able to say, you know, how are you coping with working from home? But right now, it could be, you know, how are you feeling about having to come back into the office with no judgment, nothing like that. The other thing is as well, if your culture has never been this way, mm. be understanding that you can't just all of a sudden go 
I'm really open and transparent right. and everyone can be <laughs> vulnerable now because I'm being vulnerable and expect your team to, right. to sort of, you know, come into come into play because that's not how it works. I get it. Okay. And, you know, I'm just thinking about some work that I've been doing with um, a, a group of very stressed team individuals who are actually a very high performing team. And um, mm-hmm. th- they were self-awareness aware enough to realize this is really affecting us badly. And it wasn't necessarily the pandemic that was doing that. It was some very difficult behaviors in a client. And mm-hmm. so they were smart enough to recognize, you know, we can't do this on our own. You know, we need some help. So I came in to help that team and work with them individually as for coping mechanisms for each of them. And also with, you know, with the managers to kind of you know, become aware of themselves, which then meant that they could become more aware of what's happening in their team and make more allowances for it. And one of those key things is simple stuff like just one to one conversations and just spending yep. time talking and acknowledging the fact that things are difficult for them and how can I help and be compassionate right you know yeah rather than just think of work first it's compassion first and if we think human about first business first, second yeah. and if you get in if you get that right yeah your team is going to perform better because they're going to feel here's the thing if you think about the yeah. performance of a team yeah and why people if we if we look at why people leave companies they usually don't feel valued they're either not challenged enough um, or they don't feel like you've been compassionate enough. Or like, they don't like their they boss, don't feel right? valued. <laughs> and this is, yeah. I am going to put a put, I'm going to put a pin right in here because this right. is why a lot of managers get really like they don't like talking about mental health. Because let's be really real. In the last, you know, the last little bit when we talk about burnout, if you look at burnout in the workplace, it's poor management comes up there, and it's like that's not always fair. It's not yeah. always fair to say it, the manager, it's the manager's fault. It actually, you know, might be partially because of the manager, but that mm-hmm. manager might not have the the tools and the techniques to be able to support their team. That's Absolutely. not their fault. Correct. So being yeah. able so being able to take a step back and going, yeah. actually, hang on a second. Yeah. How can we develop that up within a team and the manager together? That's really important. Yeah. So training as well for management rather than just saying it's your fault as managers. Well, okay, if it is, what are you going to do about it? And acknowledge the fact, well, I might just not realize and don't know what to do because I've not come across this before, right? So well, training well, on that level is really yeah. important. Well, why do, how do, yeah, how do managers get into their position? Well, they've yeah. usually been the top performing person in their team yeah. and then they've become a manager. Mm-hmm. And top performers don't always make the best management managers. Mm-hmm. And that's solely because they haven't, you know, they might under, not understand stress. A lot of, like, a lot of the guys that I've worked with, it's like, I just actually don't get the stress element. Like, I don't feel stressed. So, mm-hmm. like, I don't really understand why my team is stressed. It's like, right. okay, well, let's have a conversation about that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, actually, we need, as managers, a little bit of development work in terms of being in other people's shoes for a little while might be really handy, right? Empathy. Yeah, absolutely. Compassion, empathy, those things. And it's really interesting, isn't it, that part of what's driving this is the need for performance is also based on soft skills, right? It's not all Mm -hmm. about production. Actually, you get better production if you develop your soft skills and you recognize the strengths and weaknesses in your team and also people's resilience and things like that. And you accommodate for that and help people to get over those things or to recognize those, Mm -hmm. then actually that helps too. And Michael Langan says, good morning, everyone um, has a responsibility to support uh, their own. Yeah, everybody has a a responsibility to support their own mental health. The management must support individuals to have space to be aware. Absolutely, spot on, Mm Michael. I think that's where we're coming on. Thank you for joining in, uh, Michael. That's really handy, useful. So leading on from behaviors, you know, from resourceful behaviours that we're talking mm-hmm. about here, you know, how do we build better resilience, Katie? You know, what kind of coping mm-hmm. strategies? What kind of two-way systems are we talking about here? What's this kind of dynamic between work, rest, and play? Yeah, well, if you think about Talk resilience, about resilience is what that bounce back ability. Now, I love bounce asking this ability. question. Yeah. If you ask people now, it's like, how do you see resilience? They're like. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it's just being able to cope in difficult times. It's being able to, you know, work in really hard times. It's kind of like yeah. the grit your teeth and bear it. It's like, actually, no, that's <laughs> yeah. not resilience at all. Resilience really uh, is one of those things where it's being able to bounce back means you need to be able to understand when you can work really hard and having those rest times as well. Being able to, you know, you can't sprint a marathon. So being able to understand when you do sprint, when you back down, you know, when to take it slow. So being able to understand, um, when to push, when to pull back. And it's all about understanding where you're physically at, Mm -hmm. mentally and emotionally at as well. And so what I actually say to people is become, the first step to be more resilient is to be self-aware. 
Self-aware. I'm like spend some time in the morning. So what's the first thing that you do in the morning for most people? Get up, check your phone, check your emails, check your mm-hmm. messages, go on social media. Stress, and stress, so what stress, you're stress, doing stress. there is you're looking yeah. at other people's wants, needs, and desires. Mm-hmm. You're not focusing on yourself. So giving yourself 30 minutes in the morning to actually go through how am I physically feeling today? How did I sleep last night? How much can I really give to today? Mm-hmm. How am I actually emotionally doing? Am I anxious? Am I overwhelmed? Am I frustrated? Am I angry? Actually understanding where you're starting the day at and being able to understand, you know what? How much can I really give? It's unrealistic to say I can give 100% every single day. That's just going to make you burn out. That's not going to make you resilient. Mm-hmm. What you're able to do is actually go with the flow and being able to understand, you know what? Today I'm going to give it like 110%. <sighs> but tomorrow I might just, you know what? I'm going to do as much as like your 100% today and your 100% tomorrow might be vastly different and be okay with that. Stop pushing for perfection. Mm. Stop pushing for it. It's going to make you burn out. So being able to build up the resilience by just first checking in with yourself, seeing where you're starting the day off as. Now, uh, then it's being able to create your day based around that. Obviously, we have moments where it's like, well, sometimes I don't have a choice. I've got back-to-back meetings. I'm doing X, Y, and Z, but it's understanding at least you know where you're at and you're not trying to push yourself too far. But giving yourself the time and the space then to go, do you know what? I need to have a bit more rest this weekend. If you've got like back, you know, social, social, social um, stuff's coming out now. So if you're finding that you're really tired, being able to take a step back on, you know what, maybe I won't go to 10 social events, maybe actually having some time to myself. Yeah. But again, Building up your physical resilience is going to help you build up your mental resilience too. So gotcha. exercise, diet, sleep, all rest, those things. I really all like of that, those things. That take the time out and rather than hit the the social media on our phones and the dopamine hit we get from that, and that's a problem, isn't it? The dopamine sort of addiction effect of our phones and the constant drip, drip, drip feed of the fear of mm-hmm. missing out and and the FUD that that creates, you know, is taking mm-hmm. the time out instead. And I think what I'm hearing from you, I love that push-pull, by the way. I love that expression mm-hmm. of, you know, we push and we pull a little bit in our lives. And, you know, that, just teasing this out a little bit more, I've got a phrase I think that might help here, is that it's okay not to be okay. And yeah. that's okay, you know. And yet yeah. we always think that, no, no, if I'm not okay, that's not okay, right? So I've got to be okay. Mm-hmm. And so we put ourselves under pressure <laughs> to be okay. And yeah, if we just stop and kind of say, do you know what? I'm actually not okay. And mm-hmm. it's okay not to be okay and to acknowledge the fact that well, I'm not okay. I need a bit of rest. Yeah. Um, you know, for, for me over this, you know, this last few weekends, I've literally just not worked because I've realized that I'm just working all the time and too much work makes Jack a dull boy, right? Um, <laughs> but in addition to that, you know, just not getting recuperation time. And, you know, I feel so much better for having a weekend off. Um, and that's been really helpful. And uh, Jack Wright, good morning, Jack Wright. Uh, he says, morning, great content. Managers need to know um, their team members and handle them accordingly. Important to understand not everyone is the same. Spot on. That Absolutely. is 100%. I was yeah, actually going to point that, that out today. Yeah. It's, I think with managers, it's like I've just got one. I've got a management style. It's like, that's fantastic. Yeah. But how is that impacting your individual teams? Like I remember having a manager and she came up to me. She's like, I actually just don't know how to manage you. I was like, that's okay let's have a let's have a conversation, have a conversation. Right. you know like yeah. you know she's like i just don't you get your work done you do x yeah. y and z and i was like well how about if i just and if i do something wrong let me know yeah. if i'm struggling i'll let you know yeah. no judgment right and i think that you just contract being, differently right being able to take mm. a step back and here's the other thing as well we're in a really specific time in the world where everyone has different yeah you know have have different working places you know you might have somebody in your team that's got a perfect home life they've got everything's really cruisy everything's really good so they're actually not too bad but you might mm. have somebody else that's actually going through a really rough patch you know yeah. with relationships with yeah. kids being at home yeah. um maybe they've got family members that are unwell as mm. well you can't treat that person the exact same as somebody that's uh, you know firing on all cylinders so being able to have that conversation with your team individually mm. and sitting down talking about expectations for each other Right, isn't expectation is a big one. Yeah, and it, the whole thing about fairness, isn't it? Because quite often a management concept is, well, it's got to be fair to everybody, right? 
Um, but actually here, you know, you're talking about individuals and caring for each individual in an individual mm-hmm. way. And that's really interesting. And Tanya says here, yeah, actually, there's a question for us here. Let's let's answer Tanya's question. What tools can you suggest? Yeah. What tools can you suggest to manage a team that works remotely? Often working from home, you burn the midnight oil, Ooh. Mm-hmm. but way longer than you would in an office. Mm. Grit is the key here. But with remote work, you do not pick up the body language cues of your remote team. Katie, take us away on that Yes. One. Yeah. So that's a really, really tough one. Mm. So let's let's take a step back and looking at why people are working harder yeah. while being at home and especially okay. people within a team and an employee. Yeah. So if we look at the last year and we just look at how people are, are looking, they, they might your team might be feeling like their job is under pressure. So they mm. might actually be sitting there going, you know what, like I've got to work really hard. Maybe you have, a few of their teammates have been were made furloughed. Maybe they got made redundant. So they actually might be in that survival mm. mode where they're like, I have to show my worth and I have to show that I'm working really hard. So that's one thing. So you've got to understand where it's coming right. from. Yep. The second thing might be that person just might be really bored and they have nothing else <laughs> to do. So they're just working. And I, I know I did that, right? With my yeah, business, right. like I have nothing else to do. Might as well just <laughs> throw myself into some work. So understanding... Right. those areas as well. Um, it might also be something that they might be escaping. Maybe the home life isn't that great and going into work is a safe zone for them. So they can act, yeah, so they can overcomp- well, overcompensate, but they can compensate that. Yeah. So I think it's being able to understand why they're doing it and how you can manage that. So mm. I'm always like get to the root cause and then solve the root cause because that makes a bit more sense. But yeah. things that you can do as a manager is, you know, obviously encourage that downtime. Um, what I've seen work really, really well is actually coming up with a structure where people aren't allowed to, you know, not 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 allowed to, but it's frowned upon emailing outside of core working hours unless it's really important. Oh. Um, really encouraging that, you know, getting out and at lunchtime going for a walk, getting out and doing some exercise, um, <laughs> and doing and actually having moments in the day where you're talking to your team, but not just about work. I think oh. that that can be really really helpful totally to agree. sort of absolutely, you know, yeah. have. If you're going to go into have a 30 mm. minute coffee hour that's you know no work conversation allowed yeah, that, that can be hugely helpful too mm. i really like those strategies I, I love that sort of you know have some rules in place you know as a team yeah. and they're informal rules they might be just more like principles like a principle we agree on is that we have a coffee morning you know x number of times a week or once a week or whatever where we don't talk about work another principle could be look guys you know i really encourage you to go and put your pens and paper down and you know or or your computers down and you know go for a walk for a half an hour in the sunshine while we still Mm -hmm. got it um yeah so i think those are and 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 i think also another good principle is not um having the you know, one of the biggest things is that people, you know, team members are calling team members when they're not working outside of core hours to talk about work. Make that a, like, make that a something in principle. It's like, I will not call you outside of work unless it's either like, unless it's like really important depending on, on your work and really having that, like coming up with a system, like what actually is, an important call to do outside yeah. of work or going, you know what, I'm just going to have a chat with you because you're my friend. Yeah, you know, having a buddy yeah. system where you just talk and rather than mm-hmm. talk about work, you talk about each other and just help yeah. each other. And, and Tanya says, um, actually spot on, um, accurately hit the nail on the head. I like the suggestions you made to put boundaries in place from top down and also some let's have tea discussions with your team. Thank you. Yeah, virtual margaritas is one of my favourites. I have to <laughs> say, you can't beat a margarita on a Friday and share that with your team and we, we all turn up with cocktails right well there you go you can Unless... actually do like a cocktail like training session or something like yeah. that where oh. and I've, seen some, I've seen some pretty cool stuff i've seen some pretty cool stuff on on yeah. on the team you i know, really just... like that you know learning to cook or making a cake or something completely not work related and by super the way random yeah super random. You know, cool. And cocktails don't have to be alcoholic either, right? You know, no, you not alcoholic ones as well. So at the risk of offending anyone that doesn't like alcohol. So, you know, all of those things are possible. I really like that, doing something different as a team. And, you know, thinking about habits for a moment, how can we kind of work through some of these these habits, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of setting goals, Katie? Talk to us a little bit more about goal setting. And this, we've got a sort of final few moments now. You know? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest things, you know, I mean, I work with your your Taipei professionals, the all or nothing kind of people where they all just go nothing. all yeah. in and they're just like, all right, you know, 
I'm going to get my diet, my exercise, and my sleep. It's going to be 100% as of next week. It's like, actually, take a step back. Where are you starting from? If you're going to bed at 1 a.m. in the morning and you're only getting five hours of sleep, um, your diet's in shambles, like you're having takeaway, <laughs> breakfast, shambles. lunch, yeah. <laughs> dinner. Um, you're not exercising at all and you haven't exercised for five years. Yeah. It'd be really unrealistic to go, next week, I'm going to have the perfect diet. I'm going to exercise every day and I'm going to go to bed at 9 o'clock at night yeah. and get a good night's sleep. Yeah. Sounds fantastic, but mm. it's just not sustainable and it's not going to work right. the way you are right right now. You've created really bad habits. You have to slowly break those bad habits and replace them with good habits. Slowly break and, them down and replace them with good habits. Gotcha. Okay. So pick on. one thing yeah. that you want to focus on. One so thing, maybe folks. One thing. Yeah. Get that going. Get that right. So if your yeah. goal is, you know what, my, my breakfast, lunch, and dinner is in shambles, focus on, you know what, I'm just going to have a really good breakfast for the next week. If, it, if you so want to have a good lunch, then go for it for sure. But start off with one thing that you know it's a bit of a challenge, but it's not overwhelming. You're not overhauling your life. One of the biggest things that I see people do, team managers do, companies do, they try to overhaul. Yeah. And sometimes that overhaul, you're going to get a lot of resistance. Human beings actually don't typically like change because it makes us uncomfortable. And if you think about being uncomfortable from like – you know, our ancestors being uncomfortable is usually we're in a life or death situation. So we're constantly trying to find a way to get back into the comfort zone. So being able to not go too far out of it, but still push yourself a little bit, uh-huh. you know, still push yourself just a bit, but yeah. don't overhaul. It just doesn't work for the long. It, it's We're not looking for quick wins. We're actually looking for long-term wins. Okay. So little, little steps, right? But make yeah. those little steps a habit and little steps lead to bigger things as we get yeah. used to one thing. So we might start up with say doing 20 press-ups a day, which then end up to be 50 press-ups, which then, you know, in a few weeks time when our body gets more conditioned, we become you know, more habitual to doing a larger amount of press-ups and get them out of the yeah. way and, and enjoy doing that. Right. And it's like exercise, right? You know, one of the biggest things that I tell um, people that I don't have time to exercise, I'm like, okay, cool. Well, do you have 15 minutes in the day, three times a week? They're like, oh yeah, 45 minutes in a week to do. I was like, okay, mm-hmm. cool. Do 15 minutes of high intense interval training. Now the pushback I get from that is, well, I'm really unfit, so I can't do these high intense interval training sessions. It's like, but your high intense interval training session might be vastly different to somebody else's and that's completely fine. You might only be able to do five squats, five push push-ups, and, and five sit-ups and as many times as you can in 15 minutes. You might only get, you know, four or five rounds or something like that, or, you know, obviously maybe a bit more. But as you get better, you, you know, as you get a bit better, you can do more. So starting meeting yourself where you're at and meeting yourself and understanding the expectations of where you're at, not where, you know, comparing yourself to somebody who's been exercising for 15 years <laughs> and, got, you know, that's not realistic, yeah. right? It's not fair either, is it? Yeah. It's not fair. Yeah. So yeah. being able to start where you're at and yeah. being able to just build that in and the exercise piece is really important, right? So even if you mm. just do 15 minutes of hit three times a week, that's going to have a huge impact, not just only on your body, but also your mind. Oh. There's a lot of things going on yeah. um, mentally. There's a lot of research coming out right now mm. talking about a protein that cut releases in the brain when we've done 15 minutes of high intense interval training, which is brain derived neurotrophic factor. Ooh. And that absolutely helps increase um, resilience. It actually helps increase the new yeah. neural pathways in the brain. So it actually helps you face more challenging tasks. I like that. And you know what, during the uh, you know, I've talked about this before, but during the lockdown, I started to do planks and just, and, and part of that wasn't, you know, to see how strong I was, although I have to say I was competing against you, KT, <laughs> which is just my competitive streak, right? But but actually just doing a little bit of that was so helpful because it's painful and there's nothing worse in some way. It's like doing a cold shower, which I did all the way through the winter, by the way. Um, and it's like that kind of flinch moment that what you're doing is you're building up as you said the resilience the Mm -hmm. endurance of our bodies which then also affects our minds because it's something Mm -hmm. we're not we don't want to do it's horrible we don't enjoy it but actually when it's done you get that sense of achievement it releases a whole bunch of endorphins and other chemicals and proteins you were talking about but actually at the end of the day it does it does help us to kind of have the mental toughness if you like as well katie yeah yeah. I find doing something physically challenging really does help with the mentally mental, mental challenge. Yeah, yeah it. Yeah. Like I and I find. I know it sounds really weird, but I actually find it easier to do that mm. than trying to do something. Like I find it if I've done something physically challenging in the morning. Okay. I find it easier to do mentally challenging things in the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. You. Yeah. You mentioned this to me the other day. Actually, that actually 
it's useful to do certain things in the morning and certain things in the afternoon and, and yeah. make a difference. So we'll, I'll come back on that in a moment, but just want to pick up Chris Lever's comments. So good morning, Chris. So Chris says, great interview. Uh, there was a good article in the New York Times yesterday. We need to pick that up, Katie. And I think he's even given <laughs> us the link here, actually. Um, says, we're suffering from languishing emptiness and stagnation. You're nailing the ways through. Well done, Katie. So that's great. That was Chris's comment there. Yeah. And Jack says, Jack Wright says, uh, realistic goal setting. Yeah, achieve the first goal before thinking about achieving the 10th goal. Absolutely. Well, like, I always, yeah. when I talk to people, they're like, I want to do, you know, I want to do this. You know, it's yeah. like a five-year goal. Yeah. Like, that's five years away. That's fantastic. <laughs> You're on step 100. Yeah. Let's bring it back. What's the first step you need What's to do? What's the first step? Little and steps. I, and, you know, yeah. it, it's being able to say, you know, obviously I've been, when I first started my career as a nutritionist, people were like, I want to lose, you know, 20 kilos. It's like, yeah. okay, well, let's look at just losing one kilo. And yeah. how does that, let's, let's look at this week. You want to lose a kilo this week? Okay, fantastic. In 20 yeah. weeks, you would have lost 20 kilos. Let's not focus just solely on the 20 kilos. Let's focus on the first step. And this is the same with business, right? Like, yeah. you know, we all, like, if, if you've ever been, Bet you the first time anyone ever set up a business, it's like, I want to bill a million pounds or whatever it is. It's like, <laughs> just, just try to get the first few pounds in and yeah. then, then it snowballs it from there. Yeah, little yeah. Bits. yeah, like compound interest, right? It builds up. Katie, we're almost out of time, but just, just take us on that, that journey about different goals for different times of the day. That might be quite useful for our people. Yeah, I mean, it really depends on who you are. So mm. um, re- I, was really, I was listening to a really interesting podcast by Rich Roll, and I do not remember who he was interviewing, but he was talking about sleep. Yeah. Um, and, you know, obviously, like, that's a really big, that's a good topic. 100% re- go listen to it for that. But it was actually really interesting <laughs> listening to um, the research that's coming out about genetics, about evening people, so like night hours and mm. morning people. Ah, now, what's yeah. really interesting in the mm. last 12 months is that people who are night hours have probably really loved this like lockdown where they can do what they want the way that they want because realistically, we're not all made to be morning people. I'm 100% a morning person. Yeah, like I, I am 100% a morning person. I'm naturally yeah. awake. I bounce out of bed. Yeah. But come, <laughs> come at me at 5 o'clock, I'm like, do not talk to me. Like, do not ask me to do something <laughs> challenging. Um, but... It's being able to understand where you're at and what you can do. So if you're a morning person, it would be probably logical for you to actually get the exercise in, do your bulk work for like, you know, your, your core hours of work, you know, three hours or whatever it is, and then have a, an easier afternoon. But if you're a night owl, it might actually be better for you to have a slower morning and then, you know, focus on doing something in the evening. Um, but I think for me, I think what you were talk, what we were talking about was, I don't know, was it was it you and I that were talking about how I, I quit caffeine? Yeah. Okay, so I quit caffeine. This is my. This is might be what what we we're talking about. So I quit caffeine cold turkey, and it was because someone challenged me. And I'm super competitive, so I had to do it. Um, <laughs> and I found that the only way to get through the caffeine withdrawals was to go and do a high intense interval training session, specifically outside. Because even though my head was pounding right after the exercise, because endorphins actually help reduce pain. Um, mm-hmm. I actually didn't have the headache after that as well. So that was really helpful for anyone that wants to quit caffeine. Okay, to quit caffeine. But coffee's okay for you, so all the experts are saying that. Oh, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. so, caffeine, so caffeine's not too bad. I just did it because someone challenged me because I've been drinking coffee since I was 13. It's terrible. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, but, you know, now 20 odd years later, I'm like, I've never not had a day without coffee. So yeah. let's give it up. And I mean, what? I quit it in February and I'm still going right now. Well, so. well done. My gosh. No, yeah. I do like a good cup of coffee, but it's a ritual for me. You know, I'm, I like all the smells and the, I grind the coffee and I, oh, it's part of a whole ritual. I love it. Yeah. So, yeah. I still have yeah. my decaf, but yeah. it's not the same. It's the same. Uh, but I'm still, same. I'm still happy with the fact that it's also, um, if you are really struggling to sleep, the half life of caffeine is eight hours or something like that. So wow. if you have, yes, yeah, so if you have a coffee at 12, it's half life, you know. You've got you say drinking half a coffee at eight o'clock at night. Okay, so when would you? So if you do drink co- coffee, when do yeah. we stop drinking coffee then, so that we can catch up at night? I I would honestly say at like at least twelve hours before you want to go to sleep. Okay. At least. Um, right. I mean, to be fair, you know, you've got those people that oh, I have a coffee just before I go to bed and I go to sleep and I'm completely fine. But yeah. it's understanding you might not be getting into the deep sleep and actually uh, getting into that really restorative uh, sleep. Really so, useful. So yeah. so it's there's a lot of interesting research coming yeah, out of the caffeine really and the sleep stuff and yeah. 
all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. So for me, I I, I do actually stop drinking coffee from 10 o'clock onwards. So that would work yeah. out well for me. So there you go. Katie, that's been really interesting. It's been a canter through and really <laughs> exciting, high energy. It's been an absolute delight having uh, you on Leaders Live um, today, Katie. Love Thanks your stuff. Um, you've got a lot of love in the room today. Um, so great interview. A lot of people are saying so. You know, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for, uh, and for you guys, for Tanya, for Chris, for Jack, uh, for Michael um, and Andrea and Graham. You know, thank you very much for contributing. Brilliant to have you, kind of introducing yourself into into what we're doing and and just kind of interacting with us. That's been absolutely brilliant. We've loved every minute of that. So, nice. thank, thank you. you again and uh, have a great day, Katie. And folks out there, have a brilliant rest of your day, whether you're in the morning of your day and and stop drinking coffee in the next hour or so. <laughs> <laughs> if you're in the UK, uh, if you're in the, your afternoon, okay, great. Have a great afternoon. And if it's your evening, have a great rest, great sleep and enjoy uh, enjoy your evening. And uh, Katie, thanks again. Cheers for now. And I'll see you on the other side. Cheers, folks. Yep. Bye-bye now. <laughs>